lead authors of the American Academy of Neurology and the American Headache Society's newest guideline titled Evidence-Based Guideline Updated, Pharmacologic Treatment for Episodic Migraine Prevention and NSAIDs and other complementary treatments. In addition, we welcome Gina Jorvan, a patient with episodic migraine who can speak to her experience with migraine treatment and prevention as it relates to the new guidelines. After Dr. Silberstein's presentation, we'll take the questions first by the, those in attendance here in New Orleans and then from those on the phone. Please use the microphone provided in the center of the room when asking questions and remember to identify yourself and your outlet. Just a reminder, this presentation is under embargo until 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Central Time today, Monday, April 23rd, 2012. Welcome, Dr. Silberstein. Thank you very much. It's estimated that approximately 12% of the population of the world has migraine. Migraine during an attack is disabling. The World Health Organization has said that a patient with a migraine attack is as disabled as somebody who's paralyzed in their arms or their legs or is acutely psychotic. Those of us who have had migraine know that to be a fact. How do we treat migraine? There are two basic approaches. When you have an attack of migraine, you take something to make the attack go away. And you take something from getting a migraine attack. How many people actually need migraine prevention? It's estimated that about a 38% of patients with migraine actually need migraine prevention, but only about a third of them are actually getting it. Who might be a candidate for migraine prevention? There are no absolutes, but the, here is the following. One, if the patient has very frequent attacks, which are a risk factor for developing chronic daily headache or chronic migraine. Two, if acute medication is overused with the risk of medication overuse headache. Three, if the acute medication doesn't work, or the headaches come back or not tolerated. Four, patient preference. I don't know how many of you remember the Super Bowl several years ago when one of the star players developed a migraine attack, took something at halftime, came back with the MVP. He might have been better off taking a migraine preventative medication. And lastly, if the patient has attacks of aura that are persistent, attacks associated with weakness or other neurological symptoms that can be a risk or a danger, those are candidates for migraine prevention. What did we do? We looked at both pharmacologic, non-steroidal, and other treatments for the preventative treatment of migraine. We did a systematic literature review. Each article was analyzed by two independent authors. The data was correlated and the evidence was put into defined categories. Now here's what's important to know about the guidelines. We are talking about how good the evidence is for a drug, not as to whether or not a drug works. So there may be many drugs out there which work, but we can't prove it or disprove it. That's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that these guidelines are similar but also different from the last guidelines. And two of the three of the major changes are, in the last guideline, we didn't have the large controlled trials for a drug called topiramate or topamax. And the second point we want to make is that two of the drugs which were rated higher in the last guidelines have been downgraded because of new evidence, and that includes gabapentin and verapamil. With this as a background, I would like to say the following. It's been a pleasure working with my colleagues at the American Headache Society, the American Academy of Neurology, over the past years to create the guidelines. And as we continue in the future, I hope this will be a benefit to physicians and patients to give them an approach to take care of their headaches without having to, excuse me, without actually having to suffer them. Thank you. And now a statement from Gina Jorvad with the American Academy of Neurology regarding her experience with migraine as it relates to the new guideline. Gina, if I could just have you pause for just one second so that they can get the audio. We'll have you start once again. Okay. We're losing the audio on her. Can we pass that microphone over to Mark? 
We absolutely. Yes, Perfect. Gina, if you'd like to begin again, thank okay. you. So my name is Gina Jorvad, and I have had migraines since I was about 11 years old. And at that point, I took over-the-counter medication and no prescription medications. Um, that was the treatment that was recommended since I was still rather young. Um, when I was in my 20s and I was pregnant with my first son, um, my, my headaches increased in frequency. And at that point in time, I took almatriptan as an acute therapy. I wasn't taking any daily medication at that time. This worked rather well, but I changed it after a couple years on that because our formula, formulary had changed and it was no longer covered. At that time, I was also started on nortriptyline um, as a daily medication, and I found that that did not provide much relief to my headaches or decrease the frequency. At that time, I was then switched to, to pyramate, which worked rather well for me and decreased my headaches by half, but I was still getting about eight to 10 a month. Um, I switched to my neurologist because I moved, and he increased my dosage of topiramate, which um, helped a lot. And I, I now only get about three a month, and I also take sumatriptan for any um, breakthrough headaches. I've used the AN guidelines to talk to my doctor um, and discuss my treatment options on several occasions, and this has been a, a great benefit, um, being able to discuss you know, which medications are, have the best evidence and what will work best for me. And I think that other people should be using the guidelines as a, as a way to engage their physician and make the most informed treatment decisions. Thank you, Gina. If you pass the microphone back down. Uh, before we begin questions, um, Dr. Silverstein wanted to do a quick response. I think what we just heard is extremely important. People have often asked me, if 38% of migraineurs are candidates for medication, why do only a minority use them? And I think you've heard some of the reasons. One, people are not given a diagnosis of migraine. Two, they're started on the medication that doesn't work. And three, they're given a medication where the dose is not adequate. So I think what you are hearing now are some of the reasons why patients with frequent headaches are not getting adequate treatment. 